Good afternoon, and welcome to Personal Injury Cost 2023 with myself, Andrew Hogan, and Craig Ralph. Um, I think many of you have been participants in this before, and so you'll know the format. Uh, in effect, it's talking heads. We're going to go through some of the hot topics on personal injury costs, uh, and we welcome questions uh, in the Q&A or the chat as we go along. So it gives you an opportunity to take part, and of course, nobody can see your face or know who's asked a particular question about anything, and that can be quite valuable in this sort of context. So um, in terms of what we're going to cover today, the big topic of the hour is quarks. We're then going to have some thoughts about hourly rates. We're going to be looking very briefly at fixed costs because not a lot seems to have happened uh, on that since we last spoke about it. We're going to consider briefly, I think, also uh, the post Belsner landscape, where we are in relation to challenges uh, in respect of people's deductions from damages uh, and cisterone clients. So shall we start off with quarks? Um, picture the scene, if you like, uh, in October 2021, or thereabouts, when the Supreme Court handed down its decision in a delicate. A delicate, combined with the earlier decision in Cartwright, represented a sea change, a great swinging of the ballots in personal injury litigation, because at that point, these scales were weighted pretty decisively in favour of those representing claimants and claimants themselves. The net effect of those two decisions was that unless a case practically uh, concluded at trial, there was no way that a defendant could enforce any costs order in its own favour against a claimant's damages or costs. Now, um, once a pendulum has swung in a particular direction, it doesn't come to uh, the pendulum will inevitably swing back again. And what I've noticed over the years is that you never get to a point of equilibrium in any of the rules, be they procedural or substantive in relation to cost, uh, for this very simple reason. Nobody drafts the rules, uh, it seems to me, on the basis of what is the utilitarian approach of doing the greatest good for the greatest number in the fairest possible way. The rules always represent a triumph of one interest or another. And um, as things stood in October 2021, they seem to favour definitely those representing claimants. So the fight back began, and the fight back uh, on the part of those representing defendants and the defendants' interests uh, took two parts. The first and most obvious was to lobby for a rule change, effectively to overcome through secondary legislation and the position that the courts had established. And the second was to bring a series of test cases seeking to probe uh, the extent of the judgments in the delicate and card right and to attempt to distinguish them in certain situations. Now, we have published a costs newsletter which sets out in chapter and verse um, the history of all of this. And there's simply too much information flying around the internet these days for me to weary you with the details of too many of the cases. Uh, and of course, if you don't have a copy of that, then just drop us an email and we'll send one out to you. But um, a number of cases which took place at the tail end of last year are of some significance and will remain of significance even though the rules have changed because due to the transitional provisions, we're going to have two systems of box rules running side by side for a number of years uh, still to come. So the first of the cases which was of significant was that of Chapel and Brunswick. And that was a decision of a master of the high court uh, in response to an attempt by a defendant to obtain um, a means of enforcing a cost order in their favor through delaying paying an agreed settlement to a claimant and then forcing the claim to apply for judgment which it was then contended would be an order for damages and interest against which the defendant could enforce its own chunky cost order in its favour. And the master effectively said no. The extent and the significance of Adelican and Cartwright was that they simply precluded enforcement against a settlement. A matter of days later, there was a decision in the Court of Appeal in Harrison where the facts were slightly different, um, but uh, 
uh, uh, the um, uh, result was the same. In Harrison, in a context of a substantial clinical negligence case, a claimant had had to take uh, a Part 36 offer made by a defendant effectively two years late. There was a very substantial cost order in the defendant's favour. Uh, the reason that the defendant said it could enforce this was that because the claimant had received some social security benefits since the offer was made, uh, technically permission of the court had to be given to accept that offer. That would therefore create a court order. That court order would re refer to the sons of the action. And against that backdrop, it was said this was an order for damages and interest. No, said the Court of Appeal. Adela Cullen and Cartwright are clear. They simply preclude uh, enforcement where a claimant has settled a case, uh, even where there is uh, a substantial cost order in favour of the defendant. And then, uh, following on from that, the further uh, the, the, in January, there was a further decision of the Court of Appeal in a case called McDonald on a slightly different point. In that case, a uh, claimant had run a case to trial due to certain inconsistencies in that case, had decided to discontinue on the morning of the trial, and the defendants had then applied to set aside that notice of discontinuance and strike out the case on the basis that there'd be uh, an obstruction of the just disposal of the proceedings. That was overturned by the circuit judge, and that was then confirmed by the Court of Appeal, who said, well, discontinuing your case when you're entitled to do so, absent conduct which represents an attempt to corrupt the integrity of the trial process, is not conduct which justifies setting aside the notice or striking out a play. And so that case, again, curtailed the scope of the exceptions to quarks that defendants were faced with. And finally, in terms of the case law, um, as, again, is well known, the Adelic principle applies even to detailed assessments of costs in the context of a personal injury action. And so an attempt was made in the case of PME and the Scout Association um, to argue that um, where there was a cost order in the defendant's favour in detailed assessment proceedings, um, that, in effect, could be enforced through a side route by seeking a non-party cost order against the claimant solicitors. Cost Judge Leonard said, no, all the solicitor is doing is getting the costs of their client assessed. Uh, to that extent, the client remains the real and interested party in the proceedings, and the, def uh, and the defendant is not entitled on conventional principles to a non-party cost order. So that was the case law, and in effect, on every occasion where the defendant or those representing defendants tried to circumvent the Cox rules as they uh, stood, uh, they were not backed by the court. But of course, it's not enough to win battle after battle after battle if ultimately the war is lost by another means. And uh, in February, the uh, rules were amended by the Civil Procedure Amendment Rules 2023 with effect on 6th of April, which in effect provided a new scheme of Cox whereby Cartwright was reversed, Adelican was reversed, and one is now in the situation uh, whereby a defendant will be entitled to enforce uh, any cost entitlements in their favour through interlocutory cost orders or arising under a Part 36 against the totality of a claimant's costs and damages. Uh, and that might mean, uh, of course, that uh, a claimant uh, could end up in debt to their own lawyers in circumstances where the defendant may effectively not be paying over a pound, but the case will still, notionally at least, have been won for the claimant. So that's an overview of where we are on quarks, but I'm going to pass the baton over to Craig, who's got some points to make about the significance of it. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm sure most of you have already by now read the Civil Procedure Amendment Rules of 2023 and particularly turned your minds to the amendments that are going to come in uh, as from the 6th of April and what in fact uh, is being set out therein. Um, what I want to do uh, just briefly is to is to analyse the issues that are going to spring from this amendment. Um, I'm going to start with a sort of wide, wider and, and linked uh, question in, 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 into budgeting and that is this notion that uh, that has been a foot now for some time that from a defendant's perspective the idea of budgeting is is somewhat otiose that it, it 
it, it is a cost that occurs in many cases that has no uh, real uh, benefit to the defendants. Uh, and that, of course, is largely underlined by the Quachins and, and uh, Adelecan uh, and Cartwright. Uh, but the situation now, of course, is going to be that there are going to be situations where uh, costs are going to be capable of being recovered by uh, defendants um, in circumstances where they obtain uh, a uh, an outcome uh, which comes within the newly framed uh, Civil Procedure Amendment Rules and 4414. Uh, and so it does, uh, it, it does widen that. But by widening it, it throws up uh, a number of problems. So I think Andrew's just touched on one that I think is fundamental, and that is that um, you're likely to find yourselves in a circumstance if you are a claimant uh, lawyer, um, potentially coming into conflict with your own client. And the conflict is going to arise in a number of scenarios. Uh, scenario one is going to be uh, because your client is going to say, well, there were transitional proceed, uh, uh, provisions uh, in relation to this amendment. And therefore, uh, it only applies this new regime for those cases issued after the 6th of April. So in circumstances where you issued on the 8th of April, the 10th of April, the 24th of April, and so on and so forth, why didn't you issue sooner? And therefore, why didn't I have the more uh, beneficial watch regime? Um, so that's a point to uh, to ensure that you have covered that off uh, in attendance nodes uh, and matters of that nature and with your client so as not to get in the crosshairs further down the line of the client uh, alleging that they are uh, bereft of some element of their damages uh, because of a set off in effect through quarks against those damages and costs uh, in circumstances where had they issued uh, earlier, that simply wouldn't have attenuated. The second issue is going to come with uh, a client who then finds himself under the new quarks regime, having not accepted a Part 36 offer uh, that was made early, again in the same scenario, where they are having to have deductions from their damages, which they would not have had had they in fact um, accepted the Part 36 at a sooner point. But of course, what that does is it puts a heightened uh, need for uh, both sides, uh, for defendants to look at Part 36 offers uh, when they can be uh, utilised and perhaps to move the making of the Part 36 offer uh, earlier into the process. And the second is from claimants. They're going to want to look at these Part 36s and really take a uh, 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 a more realistic or jaundiced view as to the cost implications of not accepting that uh, Part 36, given the deductions that can go uh, to the claimant's costs and damages in circumstances where there is subsequently an agreement uh, further down the line. The next issue that's going to come up for um, claimant solicitors is that um, there is going to be a situation uh, where the amount that the claimant uh, can pay their own solicitor, the part from which payment can be made, is going to diminish in circumstances where there is some form of drawdown by uh, a requirement of having to meet a defendant's costs uh, liability. In those circumstances, there is perhaps an increasing need for claimant solicitors to look to uh, ATE insurance uh, in order to either insure against that shortfall uh, or to insure against uh, the totality uh, of this new landscape of, of, of costs. But of course, it's a difficult one because for many practitioners, certainly younger practitioners who perhaps have come into, um, into injury claims in, uh, since qualified one-way cost shifting came into being, they will have grown up with a with a an environment in which the risk of adverse costs just didn't exist, so it won't be high up on their radar. But now it's going to have to be because you are in effect you now have an insurable risk again, something that now needs to be dealt with, and something which runs entirely counter to the notion of why quox came in in the first place. The idea, as we all recall, was that the the price for removing um, party party additional liabilities being recoverable was in large part the price paid for qualified one-way cost shifting, where a claimant could litigate um, 
in a in a, a, a relative vacuum of, of of neutrality, in that if they uh, if they succeeded, all well and good. But if they didn't succeed, then unless there are issues of fraud or matters of that nature, where there's a, an abuse of the process upon which they'd they'd uh, embarked, they would even in the worst case scenario end up economically neutral. Under these uh, amendments. That is unlikely to be uh, the outcome in circumstances where defendants now can uh, recover uh, on a much more wide landscape than they could prior. Um, there are going to be shortfalls, it seems to me, uh, between solicitor and client costs and how they are going to be, uh, how that, 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 that deficit is going to be uh, made up is a matter not only that solicitors need to look at as part of their business model, but it's also a matter that comes square within the confines of solicitor own cloud relationship. Your obligation is to inform your clients as to costs both at the outset and to end. Uh, and this this throws up a, a, a new a new landscape. So what is going to have to look at considering the adequacy or, or the need uh, for after the event um, uh, uh, legal expenses insurance to to look at one's own fees and the shortfall thereon. Um you're also going to need, it seems to me, to look at the the issues of um, of, of arguing for one's costs at a detailed assessment. Andrew touched on it before. Uh, hitherto, the situation has always been understood that, broadly speaking, um, in circumstances where claimants were pursuing their costs through a detailed assessment, then there was a cap on what the, the defendants, even if they uh, if they prevailed, uh, were able to obtain. Now, of course, you're going to have the potentiality at least where defendants in uh, cases, for instance, where a part 36 has been accepted, are uh, going along to detailed assessment and finding themselves at the end with an adverse cost or having to pay defendants' costs. And the defendants saying, well, okay, we'd now like those costs, so we'd like them to be offset uh, as against you know, the cost that your client recovered and the, uh, and the damages your client recovered and the interest your client recovered. But well, we can all see the practical problems with that. Uh, that detailed assessment is likely to be some considerable way down the line uh, when your client has already decided uh, that they have uh, allocated whatever it was that they received by way of beneficial outcome. Uh, and so when somebody comes a knocking uh, for that uh, adverse cost order, they're going to, um, I suspect, uh, be keen to say no, keen to ring Leo, keen to make some other form of challenge uh, to your recoverability uh, along those lines. The reality, of course, is I suspect that most solicitors will simply either not pursue the late claims uh, or, or just generally accept that perhaps certain uh, detailed assessment proceedings ought to be compromised at a much sooner uh, point in time. But whichever way you view it, something that is going to have to be addressed because if you don't, then there is, uh, certainly for claimants firms, a much more um, heightened drawdown uh, against profitability. Uh, so for all these reasons, there are a number of practical implications that are um, thrown out that really uh, practitioners need on both sides to get to grips with. Uh, and of course, finally on the point, um, from a, uh, certainly from a claimant's perspective, you're going to have to ensure that your retainers um, allow for all of this um, because your retainers have undoubtedly been uh, addressed uh, on the basis of um, how the rooms worked historically. Uh, and, 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 and hereby is the, uh, is the point. There are transitional provisions. Those transitional provisions come into being for cases issued after the 6th of April of this year. But for most of those cases that you have on your books that have not yet been issued, your retainer will predate this amendment. And the retainer may not, in fact, therefore, be fit for the, for the purpose of this amendment. So you may have to go back to those clients you've signed up in the interim but have not yet uh, been issued, claims that have not been issued, and actually revisit whether or not your, uh, your retainer, in fact, extends to cover the scenarios um, in circumstances where uh, your client could find themselves with depletive damages if a well-pitched early part 36 
um, comes into uh, in, into fruition that proves to be advantageous to the defendants. So, quite a lot to take on board there. Um, always keen to ensure that we uh, we try to drum up business from you all. Um, so, we hope now that you're all there uh, now drafting emails to instruct Andrew and I. Um, and uh, whilst you uh, think of the correct wording to uh, instruct us, I shall un- hand back to Andrew. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, and just to follow on from what Craig was saying, um, to give you an example of one of the problems in the retainer, a lot of firms will be using CFAs based upon the law society model uh, uh, agreement still, even though the model agreement was withdrawn some time ago. But contained within that is usually an overall cap on what you can deduct from a client's damages. So if, for example, um, the cap is 25% um, net of any contribution made by the defendant to the claimant's costs, if you had a scenario whereby the defendant deducted um, all its costs, which wiped out the claimant's damages and costs, then your entitlement to charge the client is 25% of nothing on, on the wording of it. So that's a problem to consider going forward. The second point is to consider the role of ATE insurance. At the moment, ATE insurance has been resting lightly um, behind the shield of quads, but now it's going to have to step up to the plate because although defendants' cost orders will be few and far between, that's the nature of personal injury litigation, because you can't say with your crystal ball which claimant is going to um, be subject to a defendant's cost order which wipes out his or her damages, then practically all claimants need to be insured against that eventuality. And the role of ATE insurance is therefore acting not so much solely to protect the claimant, but also to act as reinsurance for a claimant solicitor's only costs, so that if disaster strikes, they're not wiped out uh, uh, in terms of their fees on a particular case. The questions are starting to come, and I think there's a two of them uh, which um, can be considered. The first is, um, are the changes to quotes removing the protection of tolling orders? And the answer is yes, they are, because uh, quotes uh, deductions enforceability will now apply to settlements, and that's broadly defined. Of course, with the Tomlin order, often the terms of a settlement are confidential, uh, and the schedule may not even be attached to the order. So there's a practical difficulty there for defendants seeking to find out uh, what has happened to other claims. In terms of whether there needs to be a new CFA or a variation letter, well, that's going to be quite a difficult issue to unpick, because, of course, if you do have the situation where the client has signed up to a certain um, uh, agreement, to what extent can you properly ask the client to vary that as against their interest? And so one comes back down to the question of the adequacy or otherwise of ATE, and this in turn may spark um, uh, another way of satellite litigation. If ATE insurers don't settle these claims readily and to speak, when they do start to come in in the years to come. I think the the other point to make is that, as usual, the rules are sufficiently loosely and ambiguously drafted that I can foresee all sorts of problems um, arising. Just to give you one example, um, suppose you have a situation where you have your proceedings issued on the 1st of April against two defendants, and then on the 30th of April, you add a defendant to those proceedings, will the claim against that defendant attract Quartz protection under the old or the new uh, scheme? And does the doctrine of relation back have any traction to provide an answer to, to that point? And again, uh, certain ambiguities which relate to the old scheme are going to feed through into the new scheme. One of the points that I've never seen nailed down satisfactorily to my satisfaction is whether um, if you start uh, Part A proceedings for an assessment of cost, those are caught by court, or whether because the substantive personal injury claim settled without court proceedings, COPS simply doesn't apply. So all of these points are still in the mix, and the cynic in me would say that COX is the gift that never stops giving, because there's always more to argue about it. Um, but as I say, this is a good example of the swinging pendulum of procedural rule 
where it's now swung back completely the other way to favor, uh, in this incarnation of the rules, the defendant's interest by comprehensively. Good Lord, we've already managed to consume 25 minutes of our allotted 60. So we'd better move on to the next topic that we've got to uh, look at. Um, do keep the questions coming. I'm keeping an eye on the bottom of the screen. I'll hoover them up um, as you answer them. So now we're moving on to the question of how we rate. I'm going to give you a potted history of where we are at the current time. And then I'll, I'll ask Craig to look at some of the practical aspects, such as how do you get more than guideline heavy rates? Or conversely, how do you limit someone to guideline heavy rates? Um, and then we might start to consider some of the um, more esoteric issues, such as to what extent does working from home um, have any effect or traction on the hourly rates you should recover? So in terms of guideline hourly rates, in 2021, we had, for the first time in 11 years, a new set of guideline hourly rates, and also a new set of guidance for the summary assessment of costs. Um, that, uh, we were promised, was going to be updated in 2023, uh, but there is no sign of anything substantive on the stocks at the moment. And also, I think the point is that it was contemplated back in 2021 that any enhancement might be linked to mechanical features such as rates of inflation, for example, rather than a root and branch re-evaluation of how early rates are calculated. Um, that's not to say that there hasn't been litigation on this point. Um, there was, um, I think in 2022, a decision called Samsung Electronics, where the Court of Appeal uh, made it very plain that there had to be compelling justification in the context of a summary assessment of costs on an appellate decision uh, to depart from the guideline early breaks. It was no answer that the litigation might be heavy, or complex, or commercial in nature. Uh, but the position would be that, um, you know, you had to make the case uh, for, for a departure from the guidelines. Now, only a matter of weeks later, there was another decision of the Court of Appeal, a case called Athena Capital, which referenced Samsung and simply reiterated or restated the position. And, and we're now at, at the stage where um, we have these guideline early rates. We have the situation that um, the Court of Appeal two decisions has given them some serious uh, weighting in its decision. And so the question then is um, to how is a judge going to approach the issue of guideline early rates uh, on, on assessment? In a sense, the answer is straightforward. They do it as they always have done by looking at seven pillars of wisdom, or I suppose the eight pillars of wisdom given the addition of the cost budget as, a, as an additional pillar. Um, it remains the case that I know of only one firm that puts forward expensive time calculations, whereby they set out how they calculate their overheads and then explain what level of profit it is against the, the, the backdrop of their specialism in a particular area of law. But otherwise, of course, um, it remains an issue of discretion as to how an hourly rate is allowed or considered or awarded by a cost judge. And so parking uh, matters there. Again, I'm going to hand the baton over to Craig to talk about some of the practical aspects. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> okay, so let's start at what, what I suppose we all know is a baseline. That, uh, the guideline hourly rates are a touchstone. Uh, they need, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're not fixed in stone. Um, they are uh, guidelines, they're not trend lines. Those are the sound bites that one regularly sees in uh, points of dispute. Um, brought by uh, those who are uh, paying, and they're then repeated and echoed by those that are receiving. Uh, and of course, it, it's perfectly correct that the particular touchstone that one uh, ought to touch is the seven pillars or the seven and a half pillars of wisdom. And you then go through and you say why you say that this should be less or why you say there should be more. But of course, ultimately, you have this touchstone. Ultimately, you have this jumping off point, that you, this guideline, and it's the weight of that uh, that I want to look at. It's, it seems to me that in circumstances where there's always been an undercurrent of a need for an evidential basis as to how you arrive 
uh, at the expense of time. Uh, that once you have some form of touchstone that is more recent than as it was the 2010 guideline early rates, now you have this updated basis um, of touchstone, then it's likely that the uh, ability to persuade a forum uh, to stray far from that becomes less likely. And it's clear that both in the interim and the final report that was produced uh, under the chair of uh, uh, Stuart Jay, that there is an intention that this particular document should be uh, referred to utilize cross-checked for both summary and detail assessment. So it, it already has inherently a heightened uh, reference from within its own text. The question then is, well, what is the correct approach to uh, defaulting from that? Uh, and, and how do you persuade a forum to either depart some distance or not deport, depart at all? Well, the case that Andrew uh, referred to, Samsung Electronics and LG Display Co., uh, co uh, was, of course, a peculiar case in two ways, really. One, because it was the first significantly re significant reported case that addressed the question of uh, what was the, the approach when one sought to persuade uh, a, 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 a judge to depart uh, from the guideline alley rates. It was secondly it did peculiar because it was um, it was a summary assessment at the end of a, a, an application where the alley rates were eye-watering, as some would say, um, and in circumstances where the departure was quite stark. But the importance of that judgment is that the uh, the court made this this uh, this utterance of merit in my submission to you at paragraph six um where having said that the that the um that the guideline hourly rates were just that um uh, and that they, they, they effectively had no application to cases of, of, of the nature that the court was seized with the court said at paragraph six i regard that as no justification at all if a rate in excess of the guideline hourly rates is to be charged to the paying party, and these are the words of merit, a clear and compelling justification must be provided. Now, uh, there you have it. There is a clear statement that there is an evidential lead uh, to be brought to the table. Uh, so how do you show a clear uh, and a compelling justification? Yes, you'll go back to the seven pillars of, of wisdom, um, but you're going to have to show something more than just, well, this was a complex case. This was the importance of it to this particular client. You're going to have to draw on something that makes it stand out uh, from its peers uh, if you are to persuade a court to depart uh, significantly. Uh, and I suspect that that will be even more difficult to do um, in front of the district bench uh, or um, circuit bench on summary assessments. Um, but you need to turn your minds to that. What is it uh, that is going to be your evidential uh, basis? Um, and it may well be that you may struggle because, as Andrew said, and I agree with him, I don't think in fact I'd ever seen anybody try to show the justification for a significant enhancement by reference to their own uh, cost of time calculations. I rather suspect because most would consider it to be um, commercially sensitive. But nonetheless, the reality is that there is an evidential imperative that you're going to have to discharge if you wish to either raise uh, the bar, uh, up significantly above, it seems to me, guideline hourly rates 2021. Uh, and equally, if you are going to seek to, uh, to pin uh, as a pain party to the guideline hourly rates, you're you're going to have to um, make the point that the seven pillars of wisdom don't don't allow or should not allow the receiving party to stray too far. Um, it's all it, it's always going to be the case that um, the guideline hourly rates are going to be spoken to as as a starting point uh, because they always have been spoken to as a starting point. But my overarching uh, point to you is that they are becoming increasingly like, in many cases, the end point as well. And if your business model is predicated 
on significant departures from that, then it is likely that you are going to be uh, faced with judges saying, well, okay, but what is your evidential basis uh, other than the seven pillars? How do you justify uh, any significant departure? Uh, and so it will take a more uh, mature and updated view uh, to those questions having uh, to be taken uh, if you are going to continue to seek hourly rates that are um, significantly beyond them. And when I say significantly, I mean more than, in my mind, 20 or 30 pounds per hour. Uh, and of course, you'll get variations depending on whether you're uh, on the circuit or whether you're before the senior court costs office. But overarchingly, um, I think you are going to need to embrace that notion uh, and go beyond simply answering the questions that are posed by the seven pillars. Lot, lots to think about. I think there's a number of points I would add. I still find it very much the case that judges in the SEC are more willing to consider higher hourly rates on a discretionary basis up than judges out in the regions who tend to, I wouldn't say cling to, but are fonder of the guideline hourly rate. The second point is that I have yet to see someone say, well, actually, interest, sorry, inflation is running at about 10%. We think our guideline hourly rate should be uplifted by 10%, possibly 10% plus another 5 or 10%, depending upon uh, what inflation has actually been um, since 2021. So uh, that argument remains to be had. Uh, and thirdly, I suppose, there's no appetite as I see it to sort of start digging deeper into the methodology of how hourly rates are calculated. As Craig alluded to, the evidence base for the guideline hourly rates this time round was what cost judges are actually awarding. Therefore, there's very little scope to actually dig in and say, well, no, you should be um, discounting these rates because everybody's working from home, everybody's given up their office, uh, or matters of that nature. And indeed, that sort of argument, interesting though it would, uh, would be to run, and probably doesn't reflect the reality um, that people have been working from home for decades. I know that I have. Um, and um, it, it wasn't something which just started on the 23rd of March 2020. Uh, so to that extent, you need to keep things within parameters, uh, otherwise you start to get into problems of certainty and ensuring that decisions are consistent from case to case. But the Q&A has exploded, Craig, so I thought we might try to answer some of these questions before we move on um, to our next topic. So the, um, there's a, a number of questions which um, are posing quite a reasonable point, which is, well, if we issue proceedings before the 6th of April um, to take advantage of the favourable crocs, crocs rules as opposed to the unfavourable ones after the 6th of April, are we going to run into premature issue arguments uh, a year or two down the line? What 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 are your thoughts on that point, Craig? Well, premature issue tends to be an argument that is uh, is run ex post facto in circumstances where um, on lower value cases where the in, insurers will say, well, had you given us a little bit more time, uh, we would have taken a, a different stance. I think you need to draw a line between those cases where you are issuing. Um, in non-compliance with the protocol, uh, and those cases where uh, you have followed any relevant uh, pre-action protocol, and therefore you are in a position where you can justifiably uh, uh, issue uh, without that kind of uh, spectre. I also think it's a rather, um, it's it's a moot point. It's one of those questions that people will pose. Um, my experience, and I suspect it will be yours, Andrew, is that arguments about premature issue tend to be raised in a specific type of case uh, and in specific scenarios. Uh, and by and large, uh, they're not the sort of case in which we are uh, engaged here. So the first thing, it may be just I I illusory. Uh, secondly, of course, that um, if, you are, um, if you are accused of premature uh, issuing, there's a line, isn't there? On one side of the line, it is you can see now, Judge, that we acted uh, progressively and in response throughout the proceedings and at the earliest opportunity when the claimant's claim was fully disclosed to us, 
uh, we made uh, proper admissions and proper offers. And therefore, had they not issued when they did, uh, you can see we would have settled this on favorable terms uh, earlier, and therefore those costs wouldn't have been incurred. So ultimately, it's nothing more than a question as to whether those costs were reasonably incurred in a reasonable portion of the amount. That's all it is. Well, ultimately, the answer to that is going to be, well, we complied with the protocol and you, are, and you didn't uh, 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 make those offers when you could. And you were fully aware as well that people were issuing uh, because of, uh, of the impending change in the transition provisions. And so in those circumstances, uh, having advised our client of the position and having been given instructions, we did what we were instructed to do. Of course, that makes the, begs the question, should you put your opponents on notice? Well, the argument must be that if you um, if you believe that this is a real issue, send them a letter. Uh, just so you know, we intend to do this. Uh, it, here are the issues that are outstanding. Uh, it, here are uh, 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 is the position as we've outlined it to us to you. If you wish to make any admissions or offers, now is your time. Otherwise, we're issuing. I appreciate we haven't been that. I mean, I've asked. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the the, the broad position. I think what it's illusory, and if it's not illusory, in those circumstances where it could legitimately be raised, it'll be raised on the basis where it's a fair argument, in circumstances where you've just not complied with the protocol. If you complied with everything you should, and the other side said, oh, coming to the table, for whatever tactical reasons, they're not entitled to do that, then it, it sits ill in their mouths. So ultimately, you're making a distinction, are you not, between somebody raising an argument of premature issue and somebody raising uh, a, an argument of premature issue that has merit. Yeah, and I, I think there's also a, a, a point which is particularly pressed in that, which is that, as we know, the courts haven't taken on any more staff to issue claim. And so there will be any number of cases which have been sent to court in February or March which are lying gathering dust somewhere, waiting for someone to apply a stamp and actually issue them. But the question then is going to be, I think, and it's a nice test case for someone, is whether if you've sent it to court, that suffices to trigger your entitlement to the old Cox rules as opposed to the new. If you send it to court before the 6th of April, even if it's issued thereafter, because the position is not clear cut. In relation to the Limitation Act, it is clear. Um, it's when a claim is broad. And that is always meant that when you get the claim form to court with the correct fee, then limitation stops running. The fact they sit on it, the fact it's destroyed by fire or flood doesn't really matter. You stop the clock. In this case, it's a slightly different point with different wording on the transition provision. But I've no doubt, again, that will be one of the cases litigated out in the, um, the uh, third and fourth quarters of this year. Now, we'd better move on to our next topic, which was um, fixed costs. And I say that because I know we're now at 43 minutes past the hour, but this might be a fairly brief topic. Um, last year, we published a King's here, a paper on fixed costs, which went through in exhaustive detail um, the scheme as proposed to the various consultation papers and what we managed to glean from proposals put forward. Of course, uh, Sod's law then struck, the benevolent scheme of fixed costs was scrapped. Uh, it was said that there was going to be a comprehensive redraft of Part 45, uh, and to that extent, not a lot has happened uh, since October, November of last year. There are no draft fixed cost rules uh, which are there to give people fair warning or even to consider uh, whether in fact they're going to do what they're meant to do. But in broad terms, what we can say is that um, the scheme of fixed costs, we're told, is going to take place in October of this year. The government has postponed the application of the scheme of fixed costs to housing disrepair claim. And part of that may be uh, because of the particular intricacies of those claims. Part of it may also be due to the tragic death of the child due to black mold uh, at about the time that they were contemplating uh, uh, the, the, this reform. But um, as things stand at the moment, it would appear that fixed costs aren't going to come in. That's going to create, again, a whole raft of satellite litigation for reasons we discussed last year. Um, and uh, at the moment, there's very little to say about it by way of further detail. Anything, Craig, you wanted to add to that? Well, I think the, 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 the questions are suddenly coming 
um, across my desk from practitioners who um, are who have a, a body of work within their firms. Um, uh, uh, they, they they form two broad spectrums. The first is when are they coming? In? Well, we know if they're going to come in, it's likely it's going to be October of this year. Uh, and then um, the the second uh, strand of questioning is well, what will they extend to, and what will be the value? In? And I think that's really the the interesting question. They're going to come in. Fixed recoverable costs have always been part and parcel of um, I think a desire. Of successive governments to 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 make this particular area um, more streamlined and more certain, uh, and given there is a groundswell now of changing the budgeting rules, it again makes a lot of sense to have fixed recoverable costs expanded, and they can be both uh, a blessing and a, and a burden. So, from firms, uh, from effective firms who who are involved in this work, the two questions really are. Will I will I be drawn within the um, the spectrum of it by the body of work and type that I do um, horizontally? In other words, will it widen out to include those areas of work that I currently um, am involved in? Uh, and then it's vertically: um, will will the value of the work that I do be, be drawn within the fixed recoverable costs scheme? So it's the two: it's the it's the horizontal and it's the it's the vertical question. Will I will I be brought within it, both in scope and value? Um, the the issue then, of course, is is that if if that is the case, and I'm sorry, I always end up back like some uh, revolving door back at the same point. Um, you then need to look at your retainers again, because no longer does the if your work is now within the scope of fixed recoverable costs, you're no longer particularly engaged with issues of the indemnity principle. You're now engaged with principles of fixed costs. And so your retainer needs to uh, make the point that, insofar as you you uh, you you, you uh, obtain a win and the fixed costs become recoverable, then the fixed costs that are are payable are you're entitled to keep them. That those become the costs that you re recover for that body of work. Now, of course, you don't have to restrict yourself in that way. You may also then say, yes, but in addition to that, um, we're going to still maintain an hourly rate basis. And from that hourly rate basis, we are going to say to the clients, it, it, we're going to take shortfall. Well, if you're going to go down that road as the fixed cost matrix expands, you need to take great care that you've made that clear to your client um, because clearly the deductions that found their way in Belsner and the criticisms that came out of Belsner, that these were not really cases that had a value that ought to be troubling the High Court. That issue um, won't be covered by that utterance in circumstances where um, you are looking to recover greater sums of costs across a greater range of fixed recoverable cost cases with a much higher value. And therefore, the, the debit that could be argued for in a Belsner-esque argument will have a greater value. And so these are really significant uh, retainer questions yet again. And I know I sound like a broken record, but um, it, changes, it changes the emphasis within a retainer once you, um, you, know, you widen both the vertical and horizontal scope uh, of fixed recoverable costs. Back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think what I would add is that one of the issues about fixed costs is that we must not forget that there was a consultation on the scope of cost budgeting last year, which is still grinding through, so that there's been no big announcement as to whether cost budgeting will be retained, whether it will be curtailed, um, how it might coexist with fixed recoverable costs. Having said that, um, the consequence of a case being allocated um, to within the matrix of fixed costs necessarily means that budgeting falls away as an issue. Um, but then again, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And again, that will feed through again to the issue of solicitor implied costs because cost budgeting plays a very important role alongside estimates of cost to clients when it comes to things like um, informed consent uh, and also to uh, unusual costs which matters which 
I think we'll, we, we might touch upon in the next topic. We're now down to the last 10 minutes, and so I thought we'd have a look at the pace Belsner landscape. Um, Belsner, uh, as you will be well aware and will recall, was the seminal decision in the Court of Appeal last autumn, uh, which effectively destroyed many of the more esoteric arguments about um, solicitor and client costs in fairly low value claims. So the notion that there were fiduciary duties that had to be compliant with uh, when you negotiated your CFA was thrown out. The notion that there were sexy points under the Consumer Rights Act of 2015 were thrown out. And in a fair sense, we've come full circle um, to the position uh, that you can still take points on a solicitor and client assessment, but the points to be argued are more conventional in effect. Um, have you charged unusual costs, which fall to be discounted? Are the costs in any event reasonable or unreasonable? But bear in mind, of course, that one of the refinements from Bells, of which did um, uh, 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 shine new light on an area or from Bostover, was that if you settle a case within the portal, or indeed at any point pre the issue of court proceedings, those costs are not assessed on the basis of the civil procedure rules, they're assessed on the basis of the uh, solicitor's moral contentious business order of 2009. And that applies a slightly different criteria. Or does it? Because one of the points in Bell's was that the costs had been assessed originally on the basis of the civil procedure rules. The vast for rules said he'd assessed them again on the correct basis, and lo and behold, came to exactly the same figure as had been allowed first time round. It's also right to note that um, the significance of bells that can be looked at in a number of layers beyond the purely legal. The first one is that, of course, it reflects the dynamics of this sort of litigation. It's not clear to me yet that a huge charge of these cases have suddenly uh, grown wings and moved off to the legal on the midst of it. I don't, I don't think that's the case. Um, and I think that there are real problems with the legal on the uh, being a forum for this sort of dispute um, uh, in ways perhaps not contemplated by the master of the roles in the judgment in Bellsman. The second aspect is, of course, that um, where criticism was applied to the sisters in Bellsman, it was related to, to the costs of vice they give as to what um, not only the, the fees were that they would incur, but what the fees were likely to be when they um, were recovered from the other side. That, I mean, it seems to me, is a client care match from possibly also a retainer matter because you have to, in my view, supplement whatever is in the law society model CFA you may be using to reflect the fact that there will be unusual costs, whether that's, um, you know, claiming hourly rates from your client but only getting back fixed costs or claiming high hourly rates from your client and only getting back client or costs. Uh, and there will also be a need. Uh, at the other end of the process to consider the bill. One of the issues that I've seen floating about is the notion that in non-contentious work, you can't use gross fund bills, which sounds a bit odd when you consider that one of the ways you can charge for non-contentious work in the 2009 order is for on a gross fund basis. Uh, that, 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 that seems to me just not to stack up, but it's an argument that is being run to try and cast doubt on the validity of some people's bills. But again, Bells and Caratish together also cast some light upon how you should draw your bill. And the master of the roles effectively has set out what he regards as a template bill, even though it's got elements of a bill plus a cash account in it. But perhaps at the end of the day, what he's striving for is simplicity and clarity. And if you go to those judgments and it tells you what the current position is, in terms of drawing up bills, certainly in low value litigation. But the Swiss drone and client challenge, I don't believe is a dead duck. I think that it's going to get a fresh burst of life if and when fixed costs come in. And then there's more to argue about on a Swiss drone and client basis. But what are your thoughts, Craig? Yeah, I, I think it's going right. I think it, 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 has, it hasn't gone away. It was simply that the arguments as they were put in Beltsner uh, didn't ultimately uh, um, uh, hit home. Uh, and so the, there was a, a belief, I think, within the industry that the whole process had gone away. Uh, I think that's um, naive. I think that's the reading of the headline rather than, uh, than the article. 
it hasn't gone away. What it's done is it's simply going to be refined and um, it will exist as an income stream for certain firms for a significant amount of time in the future. And I think it will become heightened when you have fixed costs. It will become heightened because of two dynamics. The first is that I suspect that solicitors will seek to take um, costs by way of shortfall from their clients uh, because there'll be solicitors will be dealing with more complex cases and in those circumstances unless there is an ability to recover that those cost parting party it, it it strikes me as almost an inevitability that they'll be um, that they will be pursued and they'll be pursued as against uh, their own clients um, and that will therefore mean that there are larger numbers at stake that will energize those amongst claimants uh, to, to, to bring mount uh, and pursue uh, recovery actions. And whether or not that potential market gains traction will in large part rest on whether or not when you, you are, as a firm, asked to disclose your retainer documents, uh, you can do so with, um, with a degree of comfortability knowing that what you were drafted and what the client signed will stand up to scrutiny. Um, there, I think, will be the, the nub of whether this uh, it, it, uh, has new life under the new regime. Because, of course, the point remains that those arguments that have their genesis in the new fixed-cost regimes are arguments for the future. The arguments that are being had, that are currently in existence, are still in the filing cabinets of solicitors based on retainers that were drafted many moons ago, and in circumstances where, in many cases, in my experience, bills of costs were never, in fact, uh, ever delivered to the client, were no statutory bills ever delivered, uh, or if they were, they were inadequate or won't stand up to muster, uh, or in fact, the, the, the most magnificent of heresies that seems to continue to flourish in the legal community is that it doesn't really matter what happens, yet the solicitor is entitled to take 25% of the damages. Um, I don't know why that still uh, continues to uh, to exist as a, as a belief. It, it, it does. Uh, it, it's a practice that I've seen uh, on too many occasions being utilized to believe that it isn't uh, widespread. So I rather suspect that once... Uh, firms come to terms with what can and cannot be argued and whether or not as a firm it is economically viable to encourage uh, claimants to bring these sorts of uh, deduction claims remains to be seen but uh, i still have, remain of the view that if it can be seen to be a worthwhile avenue or stream of work then it will be fertile soil uh, from which they can uh, they can grow because there are certainly to my mind significant numbers of uh, uh, agreements bills retainers in filing cabinets up and down the land uh, that were um, that are open to being challenged and properly challenged uh, because they quite frankly uh, didn't pass muster and wouldn't get over the first hurdle uh, of even uh, being um, uh, being contractually fair reasonable or permissive so um, that's my view on that. Yeah, and um, I suppose the point is that if you're a solicitor, it remains a world of pay um, when it comes to considering issues of retainers and bills. That's not going to change in any... Well, I suppose it depends on which solicitor you are. <laughs> if you're the ones that have got a business model that is going to encourage a new strand of work through the door in challenging... Uh, solicitors, retainers, and, and challenging deductions from damages, um, then um, you know that's not a world of pain. Well, it is is a revenue stream, an avenue of future business. Uh, the changes in the cost landscape, uh, the pendulum, as I think you referred to it before, Andrew, uh, whenever it changes, it throws up these issues, and it tends to throw them up in circumstances where people don't address their business model. They, they're creating their own problems. And then putting it in their filing cabinet, and um, unless you have properly followed the process, both statutorily and procedurally, 
you run the risk that, in fact, what you've got in your filing cabinets is um, a whole host of incendiary devices uh, ready to go up in smoke and burn your house down. I mean, that is a, is a real problem. Um, you, you can't do much about those historical problems. What you can do is decide that today and going forwards, you're going to ensure that they don't continue to breed. I think that I think that's a fair comment, Craig. Now, without five o'clock, um, occasionally we get emails after the uh, talk saying, "Can we have a copy of the slide?" Well, there are no slides; otherwise, you know, it would take up far too much screen space. But all the cases that we've um, mentioned today have been contained in the last few COPS newsletters, apart from the ones on hourly rate. And so what I can tell you is that after Easter, we're going to be doing another newsletter. It's going to be on hourly rates, where we are, where we're going, um, how you can try to increase your hourly rates and recovery by more than the guideline hourly rates. And then, of course, on the other side of the coin, how you can try and hold some of the guideline hourly rates. So that will be coming, I suspect, to everybody who's uh, attended today, uh, as you're on our mailing list. If you don't get a copy of it, then just drop us a line. But I think we're now at one minute past five, so it's a uh, good night from him. And it's good night, Wait. Thanks for coming, everyone. Cheers, Matt.